although by analyzing them, we can actually work out what color they originally had. And you'll see in our display case, their colors are much softer and gentler than the rather harsh colors produced by artificial dyes today. Being a Roman soldier fighting against barbarians may have seemed a risky business. But in fact, Roman soldiers were more likely to reach the age of 40 than the average Roman male citizen. Soldiers were well housed and well trained and had a better diet than many city dwellers. They were given daily rations of corn, wine, vinegar and salt, plus vegetables, poultry, fish and cheese whenever they were available. It's interesting that bad food, which is one of the constant complaints of soldiers through the ages, uh, is not mentioned uh, in any of our sources as a complaint of Roman soldiers. Another reason for higher life expectancy was the medical attention the army received. And it was so advanced that soldiers expected to live through their service and that is one of the few ages in history when men had a higher life expectancy than women because they were the medical, the battlefield medic. For the army doctor, the most common job was to heal battle wounds. This is a, an arrow, a male piercing arrow. And if it's gone into the arm, it's got to come out, obviously. You can't just pull it out. The first thing you've got to do is use a scalpel to make an incision either side of the arrow to open it up. And retractors are brought in to peel back the skin and expose the arrow. Then you can start to draw it out. If you've got severe bleeding, you might need to clamp it. These clamps are virtually identical to ones that are used in modern operating theatres. Or these, which look like a tweezer but with a sliding ring, clamp tight shut. To stop the bleeding, a cautery. You heat this up over coals, insert it in, seals off the wound. Great. Finally, you want to close the wound over. Now, you could stitch it, and we got needles made of bronze and bone, but the items that they stitched it with, sinew or, or flax, was a contaminant. It, it festered in, in infection. So they came up with wound staples. This is made out of silver, which is hypoallergenic. Insert it into one side of the room, wound, pull it over and stick it in, and that holds it tight. And the little lines that are on it, the little like decoration, they're weak points when it comes to taking it out. You snip those and it comes out easy. And they're using these in, at the end of the 20th century. They're finding that staples heal faster than stitches. So we're moving back to ideas that they had 2,000 years ago. Roman medics were also herbalists, prescribing rosemary as an antiseptic and caraway as a poultice for bruises. Another thing about caraway is um, the essential oil of it is a stimulant. And it's supposedly good for flatulence. And when you've got eight men sharing a small leather tent, that's... Uh, probably a good thing. Like most armies, the Romans believed that the gods were on their side, and so the soldiers were particularly careful not to offend those gods. Before a battle, animals would be sacrificed and omens would be studied, for example, the flight of birds or cloud formations, to determine if the gods wanted a Roman victory. The average soldier prayed to as many gods as he could manage. The traditional gods, such as Jupiter, Apollo, Mars and Hercules, plus any local gods in the country where he was campaigning. They do seem to have had a, an adopt-a-god scheme um, wherever they went. They were always terribly worried that somebody else had more important gods than them. And they were very concerned not to offend any deities. And the way that the Romans reacted to, to gods is they, they don't seem to have been too concerned about what happened in the afterlife. Their concern was to make sure they were as comfortable as possible whilst they were on Earth, and the way you ensured that was to keep the gods happy. One of the most popular gods that the Roman soldiers adopted was Mithras from Persia. She is usually shown slaying the mystic bull whose blood is the source of life. Many forts had temples to Mithras, like this reconstructed one at Solberg in Germany. It would have been very dark. Each Mithraeum was supposed to be as dark as the original cave where Mithras killed the bull. So it would have been dark and smoky and um, pine cones um, burning as incense on one of the altars. They all seem to have had this relief showing Mithras killing the primeval bull. Now this, according to Mithraic worshippers, was the act of creation 
and from this act of killing the bull, all life sprang, and you can see that the wheat is growing from his tail there. One religion that was not very widespread in the army was Christianity. It did not become the official religion of the Roman Empire until the 300s AD, towards the end of the Western Empire. It would have been quite difficult, I think, to have been a Christian in the Roman army before it became the official religion because the Roman army expected you to worship certain set deities such as the birthday of the emperor or, or, the, or Jupiter on certain days. And if you were a Christian and believed there was only one god, then you would have a fundamental problem with that. The soldiers carried other objects of worship with them at all times. One was the legionary eagle, often made of gold. It was housed in its own chapel and anointed with special oil on religious days. The soldiers marched behind it into battle and it symbolized the spirit of the legion itself. To lose your standard to the enemy was a terrible disgrace and uh, Roman soldiers literally gave their lives to save their flag and, and their symbols. There was also the cult of the emperor and each legion carried his image. It was important for the troops to be able to recognize their emperor. He was with them in spirit, if not in person, though sometimes he would be there in person, as when the Emperor Hadrian toured the entire empire. Emperor worship was also an important part of Roman religious life. As well as worshipping their gods, the soldiers would worship their emperor. One way the emperors made sure the soldiers recognized them was by putting their face on the coins the soldiers were paid with. We'll look at the Roman soldier's pay, how he spent it, and how it helped to change the map of Europe. Roman soldiers had something that few other people in the ancient world ever had, regular pay. Legionaries were paid the equivalent of a middle-class salary, plus annual bonuses from the emperors to try to ensure loyalty. To emphasize that point, the emperors put their own faces on the coins, like these found at Vindolanda Fort. There is a nice Cestertius of the Emperor Trajan. Fairly normal coin on a find on many sites. It's, it's all green and mouldy. That is how Roman coins normally come out. But on a site like this, where we've got these rather special levels buried deep down, that is the same issue of coin coming from the early levels. I mean, you know, you'd think that was gold, but it's not. It's a nice shiny bronze coin in excellent condition, no corrosion, nothing. The soldiers' savings were kept in special strong rooms at the forts, like this rare surviving example at Chester's Fort on Hadrian's Wall. This was probably one of the safest places for, for money to be anywhere in the Roman province of Britain because you've got 500 soldiers guarding it and they're guarding a lot of their own money because Roman soldiers had uh, about a third of their pay kept back as a compulsory savings scheme. As well as compulsory savings, soldiers had deductions taken from their pay for food, clothes, weapons, and the burial club to pay for their tombstones. There were other deductions too. Fines for, for loss of equipment, um, buying that extra pepper to liven up the food, or indeed, uh, if they're not feeling very well, buying some opium. I mean, we get opium on the tablets, the quartermaster is issuing it. We would like to think for medical purposes, and you never know. <laughs> because regular salaries were rare in ancient times, the Roman soldiers' pay was a magnet for local civilians wherever they went. Villages sprang up outside every fort. These are the remains of one such village outside Solberg Fort in Germany. The town supplied the soldiers with food, alcohol and entertainment, and there were always local women. Although soldiers were officially not allowed to marry until around 200 AD when that law was changed, many soldiers kept unofficial wives and children in the towns next to the forts. This was tolerated because soldiers' sons often became new recruits. Some of the towns outlived the forts themselves and became great cities. Examples include Cologne and Bonn in Germany and York in England. It was in the civilian towns that many soldiers chose to live once they retired, moving just a few yards from inside the fort to outside. 
Sometimes, towns were created by Rome as official colonies. The Roman government, as an act of policy, planted large numbers of veteran soldiers in a new city uh, called a colony, Colonia. And uh, often these were actually converted military bases, so a military base directly becomes a city. Colonies were like little Romes planted throughout the empire, a way of securing and Romanizing conquered territory while giving veterans a place to live. One example was Fréjus, now a modern city on the French Riviera, which served a double purpose, as a naval base and a colony founded by Augustus for veterans and civilians. It was the birthplace of the great Roman general Agricola, who helped conquer Britain. Fréjus was a colony for the 8th Legion, and evidence of that has been found in recent excavations. This uh, cheek piece of uh, an iron helmet of the early 1st century AD, it is the protection of the right cheek of a helmet. And it's a very unusual find, especially in France, because uh, on the Roman camps, uh, the soldiers were very careful with their weapons. They didn't lose them. Fréjus had all the trappings of a Roman town, including an amphitheater holding 12,000 spectators, which is still used today for bullfights. It also had an aqueduct, probably built by the soldiers. These pillars supported a water channel that gradually sloped down to Fréjus from a mountain source 25 miles away. Roman engineers calculated the precise slope needed for the aqueduct and then soldiers were brought in to do the heavy work of building. To build the water channel, the Romans used a technique builders still use today. They built a wooden mold and then filled it with concrete. They just had to put some planks here inside the, the channel and then they had the mold, internal mold for it. And then they could pour the concrete uh, between the two parts, just as we do now with the concrete. You know, the Romans used the, the concrete in the same way as we do. The building skills of the army helped to change the face of the empire. Soldiers built not only military structures, like forts and Hadrian's Wall, but also had a hand in some of the many beautiful and enduring civilian works right across Europe and the Middle East that helped put Rome's particular stamp on its hard-won territories. For the Romans, however, spreading their civilization carried unexpected dangers. It made the empire an inviting target for those living outside the borders and would lead to invasion by envious barbarians that would eventually bring the empire to its knees.